We're recording four hours after the budget, which was heavily briefed in advance, but still had a few surprises. We're going to talk about that and what it says about the kind of Chancellor Sunak wants to be. Alex, what stood out for you that perhaps was not uh, briefed to friendly newspapers in advance? A late 2022, early 2023 general election is what stood out uh, for me. If you look at the total policy decisions cost, as it were, that, that's always in the book, they sort of add the total spending on policy decision and the total tax and come up with a figure. You will see that it's basically a, a giveaway right up until 2022, 23, and then it becomes a really quite harsh clawback from 23, 24 onwards. Now, we know that scrapping of the Fixed Parliaments Act is due to be in the next Queen's speech, which I think is in May. And so I, I, I feel that would set the stage for an early election. You'd get basically Johnson riding high on the success of the vaccination program, Sunak still in giving away money to everyone mode, and they would go for another five years at that point. Um, well, in the short term, is there enough, do you think, help for workers, small businesses, hospitality, so on, and other people struggling financially due to the pandemic? I mean, there is a, there is a lot being offered, yeah. but I suppose it's, it's, it's sort of, is it enough and who's missing out? Well, it's more than it was. So in many ways, extending the business rates relief furlough scheme, all of that stuff was the headline of the budget. The furlough now includes some of the categories of self-employed individuals, which we have been arguing for a long time via the Excluded UK campaign should be included. So, so the furlough scheme is even slightly more generous than it was before. For me, what is striking is the total absence of the public sector from the equation. They are the people who have really gone above and beyond to get us out of the, the pandemic mess. They're not even mentioned in the budget, as far as I heard. And that, to me, seems very, very strange. And also, through the pandemic one of the things we found out is that the social care system is really creaking. I mean, really falling apart. And so there was nothing on public sector workers uh, and there was nothing on the uh, on social care, which has been something that every Conservative Prime Minister for the last 10 years have been saying they're going to sort out in the next budget. There was also a complete absence of help for businesses suffering the effects of Brexit. Um, so, I mean, to me, this equals zero lessons learned from the pandemic. There was a lot of stuff about extending 95% mortgages as long as you have a deposit, a super deduction for investment, free ports. So it seems to me like a, a, a budget, an investment budget for the cash rich. They're about to have a bonanza. The rest, I'm not so sure. Well, Rod, uh, talking of Brexit, it was, of course, uh, pre-COVID meant to be the starting pistol for deregulation in the small state. For obvious reasons, the opposite is happening. What signs of Brexit were there in the budget? Well, one of the big announcements that everyone got very excited about was free ports. And they sound great, don't they? Uh, the government wants to create 10 of them. Um, either these Midlands, Felixstowe and Harwich, Humber, Liverpool City Region, Plymouth, Solent, Thames and Teesside. Actually, only three of those in the north, which uh, surprised me a little bit because I thought that the north was going to be a big centre for Freeports. Now, when you think about what they are, they are just fenced off zones around an airport or port that benefit from special customs terms. They're basically a way of avoiding having to levy big tariffs on things that are imported and then added to before they're sold in the UK market. So they're a form of deregulation, but only up to a point. Because the strange thing about it is that the UK decided post-Brexit not to levy big tariffs on imports anyway. So it won't make much difference in that sense to have a free port. Their real value is in attracting businesses that would otherwise be based elsewhere, but they like the tax perks that they'll get from being in a free port, so mm. they move. And that's really great that the free port is in an area that needs regeneration, but it's not so great for the area that the business has left. And it also can mean that an area is booming, but it doesn't have the local revenues that it needs to expand for all its infrastructure, like schools and roads and hospitals and so on. 
So they are a much more problematic measure than they might seem. And in terms of tackling the effects of Brexit, they're very inadequate, I think. They do not address the real, the, the, the barriers to trade that Brexit has put in place. Ros, does Sunak give the impression of having to do things that he instinctively doesn't want to do? Let's look deep into his heart and the warring factions within his ventricles. <laughs> well, he certainly has in the past when he's had to do things like extending furlough for a much longer period than he wanted to. But he's kind of learned from that experience. And, he, and, and now he's deep in the rhetoric of doing whatever it takes to get Britain back on its feet and spending, you know, whatever it takes. Uh, today was today was very very depressing in terms of in in terms of the budget it was very depressing because we did, not only did we see no attempt at all to tax wealth there was no hit on capital gains tax there was no attempt to tax property in a different way or inheritance tax anything like that this is a great this is a great budget if you're you know a rich pensioner and perhaps the fact that interest rates are so low is feeding into that decision. But nonetheless, considering the radical things that I think he could have had permission to do, he was very non-radical. And I suspect he very much disliked having to say he would raise corporation tax, which is going from 19 to 25% in 2023, which is a big increase, and freezing the income tax threshold, which sounds completely painless, but actually means that more people are dragged into higher tax bands as their wages rise. I suspect he hated doing that, but his plan will be to, in 2022, say, well, things are better than we expected, so I only need to increase corporation tax by, say, 23 or 22, rather than 25%, and sell it like that. And meanwhile, he can he can seem to be balancing the books better with the plans advertised in advance. So he was on, he was clearly on happier ground when he had his cut in fat for hospitality and his extension of the stamp duty holiday. Again, great news if you're a property, if you're a property owner or a would be property owner. Not so great if you, if you are outside that uh, class of person. But it was, yeah, I, I, it was a very depressing budget because it was really playing to the old Tory constituencies of people with a great deal of personal wealth and not doing anything very much for people who have really suffered during the pandemic. Because the problem that we've got here going forwards, where you, where you mentioned that obviously he wants to talk about balancing the books, is the idea... I suppose of whether you need to balance the books, because having obviously ha had to borrow vast amounts of money to get us through this crisis, you know, do you have to pay it back? Advocates of uh, modern monetary policy would say no, that's a, that's a fallacy. Um, are we in a situation where unfortunately we've got a chancellor who fully believes in the logic of austerity? He isn't completely wrong about that, because while it's the case that over time the economy grows and so the debt gets less... The question hanging over everything is what will happen to interest rates? Because once interest rates go go up, it becomes much more expensive to service your debt. Now, at the moment, as we know, they're extremely low. They may even go lower. But if inflation goes up, then the Bank of England may have to think about raising rates and then things will start looking a lot more pessimistic. So, the logic, I, 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 you know, there is a there is a logic to to that argument, but at the moment it really doesn't apply very much. The question is, what happens in the future? A, a problem with that. I, I've been skimming the book just before we recorded. There's um, quite an ominous paragraph by the OBR where they say that they reckon their population in the UK is substantially smaller than official statistics suggest because of a significant number of foreign-born nationals returning home during the pandemic and lower levels of immigration because of Brexit. So they're saying unless most of these missing workers do indeed return or are replaced by other migrants after the pandemic, and these other words, the scarring impact from net outward migration may be rather larger than we previously assumed. Indeed, on a worst case basis, the population could be as much as 2% smaller. Now that impacts growth 
forecasts really directly. And looking at the politics of it rather than the economics, given that it includes, it does include things like corporation tax rise, which I think is only 1% less uh, than the one in Labour's 2019 manifesto. Um, was it hard for Starmer to respond to? How, how do you think he did in his response? Uh, no, I don't think it was a, a, a hard budget to respond to because what he will do is stick to the philosophical difference. When you basically concentrate your recovery plan on the idea of trickle-down economics, which is what Sunek is doing, when you say that if we just pump a shed load of cash to the people at the top, enough of it will trickle down to sort out the people at the bottom, then Starmer can adopt a radically philosophically different position, which says that, no, what we have found through the last 10 years of austerity, and especially during the pandemic, is that there are structural problems in the way our society works, and this is an ideal opportunity to start addressing those. And do you think any move towards austerity in the future will give Labour more of an opening than is currently available? When we're, I think we're, when we're assessing what room Labour has to oppose here, we're obviously dealing with a Tory government that is spending far more than it wants to. So is that, is that, is that kind of line of attack going to become more obvious in two years' time? You see, the problem is that the government is spending far more just to tread water at the moment. Austerity is effectively still ongoing. So the cuts to local authorities have been biting for a decade. There are local authorities now, one of them under conservative control, warning that they're going to have to look at taking out services or rationing services which fall under the aegis of social care. When those things happen, while a chancellor is seen to be lavishing loads of cash around, it actually makes the position more difficult to defend because people start asking, well, he's giving all this cash to everyone. Where is it? Why are my local services worse? Why are there more potholes, you know, to, to take that perennial British uh, obsession? You know, why, why can I not put my elderly parents into a decent care home? So, it's a double-edged sword, you know, because when you're seen to be giving loads of money, people expect some of it to get to them. <laughs> yes, and I mean, austerity has not gone away. Public services, as Alex says, is, are already very weak, and we've seen no appetite in this budget for investing in things like social care or housing or any of the other things that have been cut back so much in the past decade. So the question is really, at the moment, which I don't think the government has yet grasped, do Britons want to continue to live in an emaciated state? Or are we potentially quite keen on an efficient NHS, mm. for example, that's clearly capable of great things when the money is there, as the rapid vaccination programme shows? Or do we want to continue to struggle? Um, Ros, Sunak remains exceptionally popular uh, for a politician, and the Tories are enjoying a significant poll bounce, which is, uh, I, I imagine, largely due to the vaccines. How long before things get a lot more difficult for both the government and Sunak in particular? I think a few months. There's going to be great, you know, great joy when the, hopefully, as the economy opens up again and people can do what they want to again. And then I think a sense of dis dissatisfaction will creep in. Because things change very rapidly in very extraordinary ways in spring last year. And for some of the, some people, those changes were welcome. Things like working from home, things like the state supporting you rather than you losing your job in many cases. Those were things that were welcome. For others, they were very, very unwelcome. But it showed the power of the state. And I think they have underestimated a the desire for change that will kick in once people have you know, their freedoms back, to use mm, a cliche, mm. and they have time to reflect on what government is capable of doing and what it might be doing if it showed any inclination to do so. Mm. Um, Alex, I noticed that, that Starmer brought up Sunak's role in blocking the circuit breaker lockdown in September, which I, yeah. thought, which I thought was wise, because I think the thing that, that doesn't really get through to the public and doesn't seem to have had any effects on Sunak's popularity is actually how bad his judgment has been 
on in terms of lockdowns and in terms of um you know turning back the virus yeah i i, I think what ros said is really really shrewd and smart uh, effectively when the crisis subsides a reflection will begin on what went wrong and remember even under the best scenario for vaccination they still expect another 30,000 people to die so we're looking at figures approaching sort of 160,000 by the end of the year and i think in the in the harsh light of day when you compare those to other similar european countries or western countries i think people will begin to think that this government has questions to answer